Welcome to Sunday morning service here at Midland Baptist Church. Let's begin with a, a call to worship. This is Holy Ground. This is Holy Ground. We're standing on Holy Ground. For the Lord is present and we're church announcements before we uh, get into the message this morning. The Journey of Hope uh, is scheduled to be open on May 8th and 9th at the regular hours. Uh, I'm sure that that uh, information will be changed or disseminated if, if there is a change, but right now it's scheduled to be open. Uh, don't forget that Mother's Day is May 10th, uh, Sunday, May 10th, and so don't forget your moms. Uh, we have a few prayer requests, uh, a couple from Kathy Stratton. She's asked that we pray for her friend, Miss Vicki, and a, another friend, Wayne Sewell, who both have uh, medical issues. Pray for their medical needs. And uh, we have a prayer request for a baby, Allison, Ellison, Allison Ellis O'Brien, who is at the Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. Uh, don't forget to pray for this, this young baby. Ms. Freeland has asked that we pray for her friend Helen. So we have uh, many medical needs here, uh, uh, needs for sicknesses and uh, various healings. And, uh, so remember all of these prayer requests. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Lord, we do come to you and we ask you to uh, remember our church, remember us as a body, Lord, that you continue to keep us unified together as a, a body of Christ, even under these difficult conditions. We look forward to the day when we'll be able to worship uh, uh, together in person again but until then we are grateful for this opportunity to come together in in this form and fashion lord we do ask that you hear these prayer requests lord for those that are in need of physical healing for those that are in need of uh, uh, a touch of the healing hand of god lord we ask you to touch each of these that we've mentioned this morning and all of those that are on the hearts and uh, minds of our uh, our congregation as they pray with me this morning for uh, various needs and various requests. Lord, we ask that you uh, relieve us of this uh, this virus, Lord, that you remove that obstacle from the church so that we can gather again. Lord, we ask you to protect us from it and not let us, any one of our church members be sick. Lord, we ask for uh, uh, guidance for our uh, political leaders, Lord, as they... Uh, uh, try to work through this with the reopening of our state and reopening of our nation. Lord, we uh, look forward to the reopening of the church, but Lord, we know that uh, uh, we're still waiting for uh, guidance in that regard, and we ask you to, to lead us in that step. Uh, these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, then be opening your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, people, people want a purpose. They desire a purpose. They want to know why they're here. Peter answers those questions for us this morning, and as we go through these scriptures, we'll see that uh, God has given us a purpose, that our, our purpose is to lead others to Jesus Christ. But Jesus said that the world hates him. Hates him. So, uh, how are we to lead a world that hates Jesus Christ into a, a loving relationship with our Lord? 
How can that happen? Peter answers that question for us as well as he writes in verses 4 to 12, and he says, coming uh, to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, uh, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become a, a chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word, uh, to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God and had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, uh, which they have observed, glorify God in the day of visitation. Let's pray together, Lord. I I do uh, ask you to, to bless this uh, reading of your word, Lord, that uh, you'll open our hearts and minds again to what you would teach us through these scriptures. This is a, a powerful portion of scripture. Lord, speak to our hearts and our minds and our souls today and, and lift us up and let us know why it is that we're here on this earth. Uh, let us understand the spiritual blessings that you poured out upon us as individual Christians and as a church and let us let us uh, uh, magnify those blessings by spreading them out uh, to those who don't know you as Lord and Savior. Uh, Lord, we humbly come to you and worship this Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want you to remember here that Peter is writing uh, to a group of Christians that have been severely persecuted. They're under heavy persecution. Uh, uh, Peter calls them aliens in a previous chapter and and, and he says they're scattered. They're scattered all over the Roman Empire. They're, they're scattered because of their, uh, their faith in Jesus Christ. And the people that are around them hate them because of that faith. So Peter, he wants to help these scattered, hated Christians. He, he wants to help them, and in doing so, he also helps us to know who they are in Jesus Christ. What's different? about us as believers. What is it that makes us unique? What is it that God has given us that he hasn't given the unbelievers of this world? Paul says in Ephesians 1 verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Paul says God has given us every uh, spiritual blessing in heavenly places, in Jesus Christ. But what are these What are these spiritual blessings that Paul is speaking about here? What, what are these blessings? Well, Peter kind of helps us unpack that this morning. He, he says in verse 4, coming to him. Coming to him. Uh, the first blessing that we receive as believers in Jesus Christ is that we have union with Christ. Being a Christian isn't just a, a matter of being a, a part of a group of people who, who share a, a common religion. Being a Christian is all about coming to Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 28, he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. To be a Christian is to come to Jesus Christ. Now, how are we to come to Jesus Christ? Well, Peter tells us again in verse 4, coming to him as to a living stone. Scripture here speaks of Jesus as being symbolically a, a living stone. 
a living stone. And when we come to Jesus Christ, we too become living stones. Living stones, we, uh, we become unified with Christ in his eternal nature. To be a real Christian is to be truly united, uh, uh, truly, uh, truly in Christ, uh, uh, truly, uh, truly unified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's one of the privileges that belongs to us as believers in Christ. We are one with him. We are unified with him. We are one in Christ. That's why the, uh, the book of Hebrews says uh, three times, let us draw near. Let us draw near. Let us draw near. Let us come to Christ. And Peter says we are to come to him as to a living stone. Now, stones by nature are dead. Most of us have heard the phrase, as dead as a rock. But Peter said that Jesus Christ is a living stone. And he says this living stone, in verse 4, was chosen by God and precious. In verse 6, he goes on to say, Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Peter says Jesus is an elect stone. He's a, he's a precious stone. He's a living stone. He's a chief cornerstone. And when we come to Christ, we too are elect stones. We are precious stones. We are living stones. Peter says in verse 4 that he as a living stone was rejected indeed by men. We are coming to a living stone that the, the world outside of the church, the world outside of believers has rejected. They, they put him aside. But Peter says he is, in verse 4, chosen by God and precious. And I've done a good bit of stone masonry in my life. If you were to see my home, you would see that it's covered in stone from top to bottom all the way around. I estimate that there's some 40 tons of stone on the exterior of my house. And I I handpicked each one of those stones, and I hand laid each one of those stones, and I, I chose thousands, thousands of stones to put on the house. But if you look, there's some piles of stone around the house that I rejected. There were some stones I could not use because of maybe they were misshaped, or there were some faults in them that I had to lay them aside. But Jesus is an eternal stone. He's a living stone. Those stones that I laid on my house are dead stones. Jesus is not a, a dead stone. He's a living stone. And the scripture says that God chose one stone. Of all the stones in the world, of all of the, uh, the souls in the world, of all of the, uh, the people in the world, there was one person who came into this world that God chose, and God said of him in Matthew 17, verse 5, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Scripture tells us the world hates uh, the, the one that, that God loved. And scripture tells us that the world rejects the one that God accepts. But we're not of this world, are we? <laughs> we are in the world, but we're not of the world. We're in union with this precious stone, this chosen stone, this living stone, we are in union with Jesus Christ. And that means that we're not dead anymore like him. We have eternal life. We are eternal stones. Peter says in verse 5, you also as living stones are being built of a spiritual house. We're living stones and we're being built into a spiritual house. Peter Peter's talking here in the, in the Greek. He's talking about a temple. He's talking about a, a spiritual house. He's talking about a, a place of worship, a place where God is glorified. Uh, he's talking about living stones. So he's talking about believers. And he says we're being built into a, a house, a spiritual house, where God is worshipped and where God is glorified. So he's talking here specifically about the church. The church is a, a, a spiritual house a place of worship, a place that's made up of people 
the, the church as we've said many times isn't a building as we are built into the church it's a it's a body of people who all have a like faith in jesus christ and we're all connected to each other because we are connected to jesus christ the cornerstone we're we're built around that stone and we're built up a spiritual body we live and we work as a, as a body, as a spiritual house within our union of Jesus Christ. And because of that, God is glorified and God is worshipped. Peter also says in verse 5 that we're a holy priesthood and we're to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So not only do we have union with Christ, we also have fellowship with Christ. The Old Testament tells us that in, in those days, God was behind the veil. God was separated from mankind. He was hidden from man, and you might say there was a big old sign on his door that says, Do not enter. Do not come into my holy presence. When the, uh, the temple was built and it was standing in Jerusalem from the time of Solomon all the way till uh, some years after the time of Jesus, there was a place in the center, a, a chamber in the center called the Holy of Holies, and we're told there was a curtain there, there was a veil that separated God from man, and God stayed behind that curtain. He stayed behind that curtain. He stayed behind that veil. He said, do not enter into this holy place to the Jewish people. He told them, don't come in. Don't come into my holy presence. But once a year, once a year, the high priest of Israel was allowed to go into the presence of God. He went behind the veil, and he made a, a sin offering for the atonement of the sins of the nation of Israel. When that high priest went in behind the veil, he would wear bells on his clothing, bells, and he would jingle. He would jingle as he walked around in there so that the others who were outside of the veil could hear him moving. And as long as they heard the jingling, they knew he was still alive. But if, if he stopped jingling, they knew that God had killed that man because he in, intruded into his holy presence in an unworthy manner. That high priest would wear a rope around his waist, and that rope would be extended out beyond the veil so that those outside, should he die while he was in God's presence, they'd be able to drag him out. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to go in and get him. Now, that tells us that how deeply God was separated from mankind. But when Jesus died on the cross, we're told in Scripture that the veil was ripped from top to bottom. When Jesus died on the cross, those who have faith in him and his death and burial and resurrection were given direct access to God. Just like those Old Testament priests, we are a holy priesthood, and we have full access to the very presence of God because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Just like those Old Testament priests... We are called by God, we are cleansed from our sin by God, and we are prepared and gifted for the duty and the service that God has called us to by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We're anointed by Him for service, and we are trained by Him through the Word of God. And because of all of that, because we are a holy priesthood, just like the Old Testament priest offered up animal sacrifices to God, we are called to offer up to Him spiritual sacrifices. Now, what are these spiritual sacrifices? Well, Romans 12 tells us that we offer up to God our, our physical body, our, our physical self. That includes our mind, our thinking, our, our physical body. Revelation 8 verse 3 tells us that we offer up our prayers to God. So our, our prayers are a spiritual offering. Hebrews 13 verse 15 says that we offer our praises, uh, uh, the fruit of our lips to God. Uh, Hebrews 13 verse 16 says that we offer him our righteous deeds. Uh, according to Ephesians 5 verse 2, we offer up love as a sacrifice to God. Uh, and Romans 15 verse 16 uh, interestingly says that when we lead uh, an unbeliever uh, to saving faith in Jesus Christ, 
that that too is a sacrifice to God that is acceptable. When we worship together, we literally come together as a body and we offer up our, our body and our mind and our thoughts to God in worship, and that is a that is a sacrifice. When we sing songs together, we, we offer God the praise, the fruit of our lips. When we pray together as a body, we offer up to God the heart of our prayer. When we come together in fellowship and we love each other, we offer up to God the acceptable sacrifice of love. And when we tell, uh, tell other people about Jesus Christ, that, too, is a spiritual offering that's acceptable to God. Why these sacrifices are acceptable to God, Peter says, is because they've been offered up by a holy priesthood, priesthood who have faith in Jesus Christ. We have union with Christ. We have full access to God. And even though we know that God deserves so much more. Our meager spiritual sacrifices are acceptable to God because of our faith in His Son. Peter goes on to say that we have security in Christ. And to do that, he can make his point here. He quotes from the book of Isaiah in verse 6. He says, Therefore it is also contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, Precious, and he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. When you put real faith in Jesus Christ, you won't be disappointed with the results. You'll never be disappointed with the results of your faith. Any person who is outside of Jesus Christ is going to be disappointed. Disappointed in a major way. Now, understand, I'm not talking about the disappointment that we see in this uh, this temporal, earthly life. I'm talking about eternal disappointment. One day, those people who are outside of Jesus Christ will wake up in hell, and they'll be disappointed with their eternal destiny. They'll be disappointed because they have been deceived by the world, and they've been deceived by Satan. They'll be heavily disappointed. I, I think about Muslim terrorists, those who would go out and blow themselves up. They blow themselves up. They're going to be very disappointed to find out that on the end of their life, after the end of their life, there are no green pillows and there are no 72 virgins that are waiting for them. There's only, there's only wailing and gnashing of teeth. Every person who is outside of Christ will be eternally disappointed and every person who is in Christ, who has faith in Jesus, will be eternally satisfied. You can be assured of that because Scripture tells us that Jesus Christ knows his sheep. He calls his sheep. He leads his sheep. And Scripture tells us none of them are lost that are his. He doesn't lose any of them. Nothing can separate us from the love of God as long as we are in Jesus Christ. We have union with him. We have access to God through him. We have security in him. But look at verses 7 and 8. Peter writes, therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the believers rejected has become, uh, which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a, a rock of offense, they stumble, being disobedient to the word uh, to which they also were appointed. Now here's a question all the time. How do you know when someone is a real Christian. How do you know? And Peter helps us answer that question. He, he says, you know, someone's a real quick, real Christian because real Christians, uh, uh, to them, Jesus is precious. Precious. Peter uses that word multiple times here, precious. True believers can't get enough of Jesus Christ. You know, someone's a real Christian when Christ is precious to them. Peter said back in the first chapter that we love Jesus Christ even though we've never seen him. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed, O Lord, come. True believers love Jesus Christ, and unbelievers and false believers don't. It's that simple. Jesus Christ is the pearl of great price. 
Jesus Christ is the treasure that was hidden in a field, and true Christians are willing to sell out and give up everything in order to obtain that pearl, in order to obtain that treasure. We'll give up everything we have in order to have Jesus Christ living in our lives. I love my wife. I love a lot of people, but I only worship Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is precious to me. Peter again says in verse 7 and 8, Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who, who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Uh, uh, that scripture's pretty clear. There's really not anything to argue there. Either you love Jesus Christ and you're obedient to him and he's precious to you and you are eternally saved or you reject him and you disobey him and he's of no value to you and you're eternally doomed. There's only two choices there. For the believer, Jesus Christ is a precious cornerstone and it's against that cornerstone that we measure and weigh out every aspect of our life. For those who are unbelievers, Jesus is a stone of crushing judgment. He's a stumbling block. He is a rock that offends them greatly. But what is it that marks out a Christian from an unbeliever? Peter tells us it's union with Christ. We have constant access to God. We have a, a way of life that uh, results in, a, a, in offering up our lives to God in the form of an acceptable spiritual sacrifice. We have the assurance of salvation, uh, and we love Jesus Christ. Look, uh, unbelievers, they don't have any of that. None of, none of that's present in their life. Peter says in verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who call out, to call you out of the darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We we Christians, we really are a very, very special people. Special people in the eyes of God. We're a chosen generation of all the generations of history. We who are members of the church, we who are Christians, we're, we're chosen in that generation. We're a royal priesthood. We mentioned that we're a priesthood. But now he has the word royal. Not only will we serve uh, Jesus in heaven as, as priests, we'll also reign with him on thrones. We're royal goes on to say that we are a holy nation, a holy nation that goes beyond race, that goes beyond nationality, that goes beyond language, goes beyond ethnicity. We Christians, we come from every skin color, we come from every nation of the world, we come from every human language that's spoken, and we are unified by our faith in Jesus Christ, and we become a holy, holy nation. What does it mean to be a holy nation? It means that the, uh, the citizens of that nation have all been made holy because the righteousness of Jesus Christ had been imputed to them by their faith in him. Scripture tells us that we are people for God's own possession. God claims us. Isn't that something? God claims us. Your own family may not claim you, but God claims you as a believer in Jesus Christ. Look, we, we Christians, we are a separated people. We are separated from the whole rest of the world. All of the people of the world, we are separated out. We are a holy nation. All of the, the nations of the world are sinful nations, but we, as believers in Jesus Christ, we're together a holy nation, and we've been separated out of our sin because of our faith. We're separated from the world's sin. We're separated from the world's desires. We're separated from the world's attitudes and their beliefs. We're called out. We're called out of that darkness and we're called into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. And Peter says at one time we weren't God's people. We were not a people, but now we are. Now we're God's people. Why are we God's people? Because Peter says God had mercy on us. 
We don't deserve to be God's people. We don't deserve to be his holy nation, but we are because God gave us unmerited, undeserved kindness. He gave us his mercy. Because of that, now we belong to God and we are his chosen holy nation. So the question is, why? Why did God pour all of these blessings into us? Why, why did he do that? Well, Peter says in verse 9, uh, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. God poured all of that blessing into you so that you could praise and proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. He's called us out of the darkness. He's called us out of our sin. He's called us into the light. He's called us into salvation so that we can testify about that. So that we can witness about that. Your testimony may be the very thing that turns up the most hardened sinner out there in the world to Jesus Christ. But understand, your testimony is more than what you say. Your testimony is also what you do, how you live, how you act. Peter says in verse 11, Behold, I beg you, as sojourner, sojourners and, and pilgrims, uh, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Peter says we're to abstain from sin, we're to stay away from sin, we're to get away from sin so that our testimony before the unbelieving world isn't damaged. We're to proclaim the praises of Jesus Christ with our mouth, but we're also to proclaim the praises of Jesus Christ in our lifestyle, in the way that we live. We're to abstain from fleshly lust that war against our soul. We're to deal with sin, both on the inside and the outside. We're to keep our behavior excellent among the unbelievers. Peter uses the word Gentiles there, but we need to understand by this point in history, the word Gentiles had changed. Uh, the, the definition had changed. Uh, in the Old Testament and in early in the New Testament, the word Gentile meant anybody who was not a Jew. But by the time Peter wrote these words late in the New Testament times, the, the word Gentile had changed its definition. We see the same thing in the book of 1 John. The definition had changed to those who were not believers in Jesus Christ. Those were the Gentiles of the latter day of the New Testament. So Peter's telling us here, we as Christians must keep our lives clean. We must keep our, our behavior moral before those who are unbelievers because that affects our testimony before them. God poured his blessings. These spiritual blessings that we received in heavenly places in Christ, he poured those into us so that we can proclaim uh, the, uh, the name of Christ uh, through our words and through our life. We can proclaim Christ to an unholy world, a God-hating world, a Christ-rejecting world. And if we do that, Peter says, there's a chance that some of those people who are speaking against us today may be the very ones who glorify God tomorrow. They might even glorify him, he says, in the day of visitation, in the day of judgment. By our God-honoring words and by our God-honoring deeds, our God-honoring lives, others will be led to Christ and they will come to saving faith. That's Peter's point here. The whole reason that we're here, the whole reason that we as Christians have been left here on the earth is so that we can lead others to salvation. We do that through our, our living, living and, and our, our spoken testimony. We do that through our, our, our spoken witness and through our living witness. Jesus said in Matthew 15, verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That, my friends, is why we are here. If you ever wonder what your purpose is, if you ever wonder uh, what the reason is why you're here on this earth as a believer in Jesus Christ, you're here to proclaim, proclaim the name of him who led you out of the darkness and into the light. 
That's your purpose. And that's where we'll end this morning. Let's spend some time praying together. Let's offer up to God that spiritual sacrifice. Lord, we, we come to you as believers in, Je in Jesus. We come to you as, as living stones who have been uh, built together into a spiritual house. Lord, we're, we're grateful for the, uh, the living cornerstone that you've given us, Lord, as a, as a Savior and as an example and as a, as a leader for the church. Lord, we're grateful for all of that. And we're, we're built into this spiritual house together. We have a unified faith. We, are, uh, we, are, uh, we have unity with Christ. We have direct access to you. We have the, the blessed assurance of salvation. Lord, let us offer up our spiritual sacrifices to you as a holy priesthood, and let us honor you as a holy nation, and let us fulfill our purpose to go out into the lost and dying world and proclaim the name of you who led us out of the darkness of the sins of this world, and led us into the, uh, the marvelous light, which is the truth of the word of God and the gospel, and, and Lord, let us, let us tell them so that they too may one day stand before you and glorify you in the day of visitation. Lord, that is our reason for being here. That is our purpose. That is our, our God-called purpose. Let us, let us live to fulfill that commission. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, I, I thank you for attending church service this morning, though it may be a little different. I, I'm glad you're here, and I hope that uh, uh, this message uh, touches you as it's touched me deeply. Uh, these... Uh, these passages are good scriptures for us to study, to know, and we do have a purpose. I, even in this time when we're, uh, we're still separated from many of the people that God would put around us, we, we still have a telephone, we still have the internet, we still have text, we still have email, we still have videos, we have all these tools that we can use that God has given us to reach the lost of this world. And I pray that even in this time of uh, stay safe at home, that you'll uh, find a way to reach those uh, who you know to not, to not be saved, that are lost out there in the world. Let us fulfill this commission. Let us serve our purpose. Until we meet again, brothers and sisters, may God bless you and keep you. Uh, I'll see you next Sunday.